All right. So I'd like to, first of all, welcome everybody to today's session on gambling and gaming disorders and the youth factor. And it's going to be presented by Ted Hartwell. Um, my name is Glenna Andrews and I'm a member of the South Central Kansas Problem Gambling Task Force, which is sponsoring this event. The task force mission is to coordinate advocacy, education, prevention, hope and treatment options for problem gambling in the community. And our hope today is that you'll take away some new information um, on the topic that's being presented that you can um, share with others that'll benefit you personally or someone that you know. <clears throat> the Zoom platform that we're uh, using today is being hosted by Chad Childs from Wichita State University's Community Engagement Institute. And Chad's now briefly just gonna go over some of the features that we'll be utilizing today. Thanks, Glenna. I'm glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> so it depends on what your what your machine is for what you see. Um, looks like most of us probably are on a some sort of a device like a computer or a laptop, um, and so you should right now see a grid of kind of the Brady Bunch grid with all of the people's videos. Um, in the top right um, of your screen, you should see a view option. If you, it's kind of like a checkerboard, really small. Um, but you can click on that and change the way that you see all of us. You can select speaker to see mostly a full screen of the, the primary speaker at the time. Um, you can select gallery to see everybody that's here. Uh, and then some, some Zoom accounts have a immersive function and I won't even go into all of that stuff, but there are silly things that you can do there with immersive. But um, when uh, Ted starts to share his screen, it will bring up the PowerPoint presentation slides on a good good amount of the screen and your videos will all move to the right. Um, there is a line that can faintly be seen with two little lines in the middle of the screen um, that separate the two different sides of the, the view. You can drag those two little lines um, either way to the left or to the right to, to make whichever you'd like to see larger if you want to see the slides bigger so that you can read them easier. Um, you can slide it to the right and make the video view smaller. Um, if you want to see people engaging in their, their faces and their screens, their, their names or their images, you can slide, you can drag the two lines to the left to show the screen a little bit more on the videos. Um, if you're on a phone or a smaller mobile device, I think Zoom only allows you to see four people at a time and, and you have to kind of swipe um, from the left or right to be able to see the presentation slides and, and the speaker's image, um, or to kind of go through and slide screen by screen to see groups of four people that are participating. Um, another thing that I'll share with you is that at the bottom of your screen, as, as far as both most screens, there is a chat function. And it's also available on, on phones. Um, we'll be using the chat function. And so if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat and send them at any time and I'll be watching it and let Ted know um, that there are questions then we can either address it then or, or Ted might say, I'm, I'm getting ready to talk about that in two minutes. And so we can hold on um, for that. But those are some of the main functions that I wanted to share with you all today. Please do mute unless you have a question. Everybody is muted right now and that's great Zoom etiquette. Um, and then make sure that you click mute or off mute um, to be able to talk. So. Thank you all for being here and I'll turn it back to Glenna. All right, thank you, Chad. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge that this event is made possible thanks to funding that's provided by the Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services. And um, Juan Baez and Carol Spiker who are on with us are both with that organization and are always available to help us out. So now let me introduce you to your speaker, Ted Hartwell, and he's going to share a little bit about himself and then we'll get started. Thanks. Great. Ted. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Glenna, and thank you to the South Central Kansas Problem Gambling Task Force for inviting me to uh, present today. I'm going to make this a little informal in the sense that uh, please, as you have questions that occur to you, uh, again, just type those in the, in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'll try to address them uh, then because I, as I get through this, I'll be covering lots of different information and it, 
uh, and it uh, may be difficult to remember those questions later on. So um, that worked pretty well last week, I think, and so we'll do, do the same thing this week. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Very good, all right. Fantastic, did that come up okay for everyone? All right, excellent. So uh, when, when Glenna first reached out to me, um, she, she asked if I'd be willing to share a little bit uh, about myself and, and my uh, personal story. So I'll do that uh, right up front and then we'll, we'll get into the uh, nitty gritty of, of looking at some um, uh, issues that are uppermost in a lot of people's minds over the past few years, especially including uh, both uh, video gaming and sports betting. And I'm gonna try to talk about how um, uh, youth concerns interface with both of those. Having once uh, a long time ago been a youth myself um, and, uh, uh, in which both of these areas were, were part of my um, kind of early, early engagement in recreational behaviors and uh, which became part of my problematic behaviors uh, a little later on. So a little bit about me in a, in a nutshell. Um, I uh, have an educational background in uh, archaeology. I originally came to Las Vegas way back in 1991 to begin working for a place called the Desert Research Institute. This is a photo of me working at a, a site down in Argentina, actually, a, a, a early kind of early occupation and, and cemetery uh, a site. Uh, and then uh, when I came to Nevada, uh, I actually was hired to manage a cultural resources work out on this place called the Nevada Test Site, which I had no idea what that was at the time. But this is where the nation tested its nuclear weapons for several uh, decades. And so I was going out ahead of, ahead of ground disturbing activities in that area and making sure they weren't going to wipe out an archaeological site by uh, what they were doing. And later that would transition into uh, the program that funds most of my time at the Desert Research Institute, which is part of the university system of Nevada. Um, and that is managing the off-site radiological monitoring network uh, around the test site. So it's a program that involves the uh, communities uh, and lots of teachers directly in the uh, process of monitoring for residual radiation associated with past nuclear testing. Uh, I'm also a, a professional cellist uh, by night. Um, this is a shot from inside our, our still relatively new, about 10 year old or so uh, performing arts center, the Smith Center uh, in Las Vegas. I played with the Las Vegas Philharmonic for the entire, I guess, 22 years of its existence. Of course, we've been dark due to the pandemic the last uh, year and a half nearly. Now looking forward to getting back to playing uh, this coming October if, if all goes well. And uh, that's resulted in a lot of opportunities to both tour and, and perform with uh, some uh, pretty neat folks. Um, done a little excursions off into La La Land in, in my time here at the Institute. We are soft money and uh, if you can find the funding to do it, they are happy to uh, have you here and so uh, uh, one of the little side projects was one looking at comet and asteroid impacts in, in human society in a workshop in uh, Canary Islands of all places, which brought together uh, a few dozen um, experts in non-traditional science series to look at what would happen if we would have a major comet or asteroid impact on the Earth in terms of its effect on human society. And I created kind of an anthropological and archaeological overview of celestial phenomena. So. Uh, done a, a lot um, here in my time in Las Vegas. I've also been a soccer coach and a volleyball coach here uh, for some youth teams. Um, but long story short, and I will we'll warn folks, the next um, slide does contain uh, gambling imagery, if that's a trigger uh, for you, just to let you know. Um, turns out that uh, scientists aren't immune to insanity uh, either. Um, I'm the one in the middle here in this, in this photo. Uh, but after um, coming to Las Vegas and living here for a, a while, I developed a pretty serious gambling disorder that reached its head about 14 years ago, uh, which is when I began my uh, recovery process. Uh, but especially in the two years before then, my life was pretty out of control as a result of uh, gambling. Um, 
it affected really all areas of my life, not just financial, but my re relationship with my family, certainly my work productivity and when I was working. Um, I'll, I'll share just a little bit about the, the arc of my story because it, it doesn't begin with my move to Las Vegas by uh, any means. Uh, it, it starts way back when I was a kid. Um, at the age of 10, I moved to uh, Lubbock, Texas, just a few hours uh, south of where most of you are, uh, I think, uh, to live with my father. My parents had been divorced since uh, I was about three, so I don't ever remember them being together. Um, but they both remarried, both divorced, both remarried. Uh, um, and uh, I uh, went back and forth a couple times between those households. And at the age of 10, ultimately, I moved down to Texas to live with my dad. And um, it was a pretty big culture shock moving from Spokane, Washington, down to Lubbock, Texas. Uh, first of all, I couldn't understand what people were saying uh, in day-to-day -day conversation for a little while. I didn't have any friends. Um, I, I became pretty much of an introvert, experienced a lot of bullying, especially in uh, junior high. And um, it was, it was uh, pretty tough for me, especially to witness my peers seeing that happen and, and do it, doing nothing and sometimes uh, laughing. And uh, it was also my first um, exposure to gambling. So by the age of 10, uh, a lot of our family activities, uh, especially uh, vacations and things like that, did involve gambling activities. And so often we would drive from Lubbock to uh, Rio Doso, New Mexico, where there is a horse race track. And we would camp in the mountains outside of town, which was tremendous fun as a kid, although I'd come to suspect later on in life it was probably so my father could save money on hotel costs so that he had more money to gamble on the horses. But by the age of 10, I was familiar with all of the horse racing jargon, win, play, show, sloppy track, muddy track. Uh, my father would give each of the kids $20 to gamble on the horses. And so uh, that was tremendous fun too, right? And I'd tell my dad, go put $2 to win on this horse and $2 to show on, on uh, this horse. And uh, you know, while there were possible gambling activities that occurred prior to the age of 10, those are kind of my first uh, recollection. By the time I was a teenager, my father had taught me how to play poker. And by the time I was in high school, I was involved in a regular weekly poker game with my own father and a bunch of mostly university professors from Texas Tech, which is where my father taught in the music department. And it was, uh, as you imagine, for, a, for an uh, adolescent uh, um, uh, such as myself, uh, quite an, an ego trip, right? To be invited to participate in, in this uh, weekly poker game with men that were two, three, four times uh, my own age. It's a very friendly game, a very social game, nickel dime quarter stuff. Nobody was losing or winning more than 15 or $20 uh, in a day, but it was my first regular exposure to gambling activities. And of course, we know today that early exposure as a child um, and certainly participation, early participation in gambling activities as a child is a risk factor for developing um, a gambling disorder later in life. And of course, with increased frequency, of exposure, that risk does rise. Um, by the time I got to college, also at Texas Tech, um, got both my degrees from Texas Tech, um, I was in, involved in a much higher stakes game, which was a pot limit game, which simply meant you could bet whatever and raise whatever was in the pot. And if enough people stayed, it meant that single hands could get into the hundreds of dollars. Now, looking back on that time, um, I still had uh, control over my gambling uh, then. And all I mean when I say that is I took only what I could afford to lose to those game, games. And if I lost that stake, I didn't come back to that game until I'd saved up enough um, money to play again. So it wasn't simply a matter of, of not having this discipline, right? Early on, not understanding um, that you know, this, was, this was entertainment at the time and I, I, should, I should save up money and, and spend only what I could afford to do. That I was certainly doing that at the time. Um, somewhat perversely over time, however, I actually won enough money in that game to move out of the house, um, uh, get my own apartment, quit my job at Pizza Hut. I had a full ride scholarship uh, to Texas Tech. And so I literally had no educational bills, essentially. So I was funding my entire life for a few years um, uh, off of this once a week poker game. And it wasn't because I was a fantastic poker player. It was because there were uh, two men probably in that game who'd already developed a pretty serious gambling problem. 
And the way that manifests in a live poker game is these two gentlemen would stay in virtually every hand, uh, almost to the last card every hand, trying to catch their miracle card. And even if they caught their miracle card, it wasn't necessarily the, the best hand at the table, right? And I, I thought they must just be the world's uh, stupidest poker players, um, although both very bright guys, uh, certainly uh, in their own right. And I was happy to take their money as I suspect most others uh, at the table were. So I suspect over the long run, everybody in this game virtually was, was winning money uh, off of these two men. And they'd occasionally have their big nights, but mostly they were chronically losing uh, to the rest of us. Uh, so when I got offered a job in Las Vegas in 1991, I was pretty excited. Um, uh, number one, because the big joke in my family had been, if the archeology span doesn't work out for you, you've got your music to fall back on, ha ha. And both of those things worked out tremendously well uh, for me, quite frankly. Got a job doing archaeology, which is what I loved, you know, wandering around out in the desert, looking at rocks, getting paid for it, right? Is there any better life than that? And then also uh, when the Las Vegas Philharmonic formed in 1999, I've played with them every year since and had fantastic opportunities to play with, with well-known musicians uh, that, that have come through town and need to hire additional orchestras. And so, you know, I was living my dream in a, in a big sense, but my big fantasy uh, was about the World Series of Poker. Now, back in 1991, this is really pre-internet days. It was certainly uh, uh, before the time that the World Series of Poker could be seen on ESPN, which you can see poker tournaments regularly now on ESPN. Um, and unless you were a hardcore poker player or unless you lived in Las Vegas, you probably didn't know what the World Series of Poker was. But I knew what it was. And so my big fantasy upon moving here was that I was going to save up enough money to enter the big game at the World Series of Poker uh, and, you know, see if I could make it to that final table with all the big names. And the day would come when I would look back. Uh, and and this is this is a game that, that has a ten thousand dollar entry fee. And that's one thing that has not changed in the last 30 years. The entry fee is still $10,000. What has changed is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of more people that enter that game because of its popularity on the internet uh, and um, uh, more exposure than ever did then. But the day would come in the, in the early 2000s when I would look back um, and recognize that I had lost enough money playing video poker, which became my primary uh, uh, gambling go-to game to have entered the World Series of Poker uh, every single year since I lived in Vegas, and yet I never have. And you could probably do that calculation in it, and, and it, would, it would almost take you into today in terms of the amount of money I lost. Uh, but as those of you here know, it's not about the amount of money, right? It, that's all relative to one's personal situation, and it's what's happening uh, when you're engaging in that gambling activity and the reasons you are, are, are using that. And uh, so I'll refer to some of these things throughout the rest of my uh, presentation, but suffice it to say that um, in the uh, early 2000s, uh, my, my daughter was born in, in 2005, which is uh, um, immediately after the time that I had told my wife that I had uh, stopped gambling, that we had agreed to stop gambling because we had gone together for a few years and it was becoming, becoming both a financial impact and a strain on our relationship. Um, we said, we just need to quit. And she was able to do that cold turkey. And I did for a few months. And then unbeknownst to her, I went back out and started gambling again. And this was kind of the beginning, uh, you know, even though a lot of these ingredients uh, I've talked about uh, were there and in place. And one I didn't mention is that gambling disorders go back in my family, probably at least three generations. Another risk factor, right? The, the genetic component. Uh, my father uh, gambling uh, nicotine use disorder also, his father, uh, alcohol use disorder, his father, my great grandfather, I, I can't prove it, but I've read 130 year old letters that he wrote home to his mother as a young man and virtually everyone um, talks about needing money for a different reason. And again, that's not proof positive of anything, but the way he talked about it reminded me of myself when I was in that cycle, whether you were my uh, mom or dad or sister or best friend or coworker, I could find some pretty creative ways to get money out of you to go and get my fix at the casino. So uh, recognizing that was there, uh, also some, uh, some of that uh, early uh, trauma, that, that cultural disassociation that occurred when I moved to Texas, the bullying, uh, 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 sexual assault that occurred to me as a young teen, 
uh, witnessing a lot of psychological abuse from my father towards women in his life. Um, we, we again know about uh, the uh, amount of trauma experienced as a child sets you up for a higher risk of, of any addictive disorder later on, right? So I'm kind of a poster child for, for all these risk factors, including a later life trauma. Uh, after I'd lived in Las Vegas about five years, I, I got hit by a really weird voice disorder. Uh, and for a while, it was very difficult to lecture. And it was almost impossible for me to sing. I'd been singing semi-professionally as well with the group. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I couldn't. And that was a, a huge trauma. And for the first time looking back, I recognized today that I was starting to use gambling to isolate myself from, from other people, right? So um, fast forward, and I, I won't go into the details uh, again, but it does involve a, a cello I had commissioned and waited for to be built for seven years that... Um, that uh, I wound up um, giving back before purchasing as part of the beginning of making amends to my family for the tremendous damage I did over the last two years of my gambling, hiding it from them. Uh, I agreed not to buy this cello that I had waited for for seven years uh, and return it to the gentleman who had made it as, uh, as uh, you know, showing how serious I was about uh, wanting to stop this behavior and get into recovery. And as I did so, I also became very interested in the idea of public advocacy and becoming a public voice uh, for talking about this disorder because we still are way behind the curve with the substance use disorders, uh, uh, relatively speaking, in terms of having you know, that, that celebrity or uh, high profile athlete, even past presidents who have alluded to their struggles with substances and how they got better. We don't have a lot of that with regards to gambling yet, although there are a couple voices that are starting to appear. So while I'm certainly not a, a celebrity or uh, a high profile athlete, I'm well known in the circles that I run in here in Las Vegas. So I, I became very open about that and am to this uh, day and am fortunate that it doesn't jeopardize any of those positions uh, for me to do so. So that's a little bit about my story. Again, I might refer to a few other issues as we get going here. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk about the, the impact of the games that we play. And uh, before I, I get started, I want to acknowledge that uh, uh, video games in general, there are actually uh, lots of, of, of um, research benefits of video games out there, right, in terms of uh, rehabilitation, following injury in terms of improving, improving memory function for older adults, uh, just for entertainment, which it is for the vast majority of people, right? Um, uh, as well as a number of other things. I'm not going to be talking about those in this presentation, but I didn't want to be too overbalanced in my discussion uh, and leave with you leave you with the impression that you know video games are bad or leave those of you who are our parents overly concerned about your child's behavior. I think all of us who are our parents um, go through that cycle with various media and games that are that are introduced and, and concerns about our kids. And it's right to have concerns, but um, but uh, hopefully um, you know recognize that that gaming disorder or internet gaming disorder as the DSM5 refers uh, to it is um, really affects a relatively small percentage of, of people in general. So we shouldn't go overboard in, in stigmatizing it uh, just as we, as we shouldn't with gambling in general. I want to talk about gambling disorder just very briefly up front and remind folks of the, the kind of the signs and symptoms. And these are the essentially the nine criteria that the DSM-5 talks about. Um, uh, that are used to diagnose a gambling disorder. And if you answer yes to at least four of these, then you are um, uh, you can have that diagnosis. Although answering yes to just one of these is a good time for some of that uh, you know, brief intervention to occur and discussion around this, right? Uh, hopefully we, we can keep some of the people who might be on the edge of transitioning into a gambling disorder uh, from doing so. But I put this up and I'm not gonna go through it but uh, just to uh, give you a general sense, uh, as we talk about um, uh, internet gaming disorder, gaming disorder, um, that you're going to notice some, some similarities here. So why are we talking about this right now? And in fact, we, we have been talking about it for some time, at least the last decade. And as I mentioned, the, the DSM-5 has it as a, uh, as a potential disorder worthy of, of uh, further study. Um, 
uh, and the World Health Organization has formally uh, recognized it. But there are a few things that have happened uh, just over the past a few years um, that have brought this, I think, to more public attention. Uh, the most recent thing, of course, is the global pandemic. Um, and I think we can all acknowledge that it has brought us a lot of the risk factors for uh, many mental disorders, including all of the addictive disorders, right? The social isol isolation from friends, family, coworkers, you know, any type of loss uh, can be a, a trigger or risk factor, loss of loved ones. And, you know, my condolences of, of, to those of you who uh, may have lost loved ones uh, during this time, but the loss of relationships. Many people have uh, experienced at least temporary loss of financial security over the last year and a half. Um, loss of connection to our, our typical medical and mental health services. And you know, kudos to the industry for ramping up with telehealth. That's one of the, the major benefits, um, kind of the silver linings, I guess, if you will, of the pandemic seeing that increase. Of course, depression, anxiety. Um, at, at the same time, you know, concurrently with all of this, the video game industry has continued to ramp up. It's uh, for a few years has now been worth more than the film and music industries combined. Last year's spending on video games just in the US alone was around $57 billion, and that was up 20% uh, uh, year over year. Um, world industry worth about $150 billion. About, you know, almost $8 billion of that was spent in December 2020 alone, which was the highest ever for that month. Um, premium console gaming revenue, 18 billion. These are things like your PlayStation, your Xboxes. And uh, really important, these, these free to play PC gaming uh, revenues um, and uh, downloadable games, $23 billion. So these are games that are completely free to download and, and play, uh, but with options for uh, in-app purchases and, and things that uh, uh, can lead to out of control spending for some. Um, one thing that happened literally just a couple weeks into the, um, the uh, lockdowns and stay-at-home orders that were occurring in the U.S. is the World Health Organization uh, put out an article encouraging people to play video games during the coronavirus pandemic as a way to, to, uh, uh, to pass the time, to lower some of those tensions in the household, which, again, for the majority of people is, is going to be uh, okay, but for those who, who may be on the verge or have already crossed that line into problematic behavior. This was not the best advice. And, and coming on the heels just a few months later of their kind of formal announcement that they were recognizing uh, gaming disorder as a, as a real thing, not a great message. Now, a couple of days later, they did put out uh, further information emphasizing, uh, uh, you know, watching the, the amount of time you're playing on games, yada, yada, yada. But it was it was a little bit discouraging to see this uh, happen. And, and one thing that's of note is literally within a, a month, um, online gaming and gambling, gambling platforms across the world had about a 75% uh, increase worldwide. And that's not something that has by any means uh, subsided uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. It, it, uh, uh, that, that increase is largely uh, still there. So who's playing? And I, I know I said I'd focus uh, on the youth efforts, but it's important to know that the average age of today's gamer is 32 to 34 years old, 32 for uh, uh, males, 34 for females. Um, and the average gamer has been playing for about 14 years. So this is not, um, you know, we need to get rid of our, our stereotype kind of of the of the teenager in the basement in front of the console, you know, sequestered away from, from everyone else, because this, this is something that a good segment of the population is playing. Play is roughly split between males and females, uh, 54, 46%. It may be even closer. There's some bias in some of the early studies that was done that may, may, uh, uh, may have um, inappropriately enhanced the, the, males within those um, uh, figures. And also uh, at age 50 plus, particularly among women, it's one of the fastest growing demographics for video games. A lot of these are phone type games. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the, um, uh, these people certainly don't think of themselves as gamers. Uh, that's that's a, a term that can be stigmatizing. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. 
Um, uh, we should really only use it with people who who self-identify at least uh, you know in their in their presence. They may look like a gamer to us, but they may not consider themselves uh, gamers at all. That for them may be a, an additional higher hardcore level of play that they're they don't see themselves as engaged in. But again, uh, the demographics have shifted uh, quite a bit. I think. Um, from, from what our perceptions are. So why, why are we playing these games? Well, number one, they're entertaining. They often relieve, relieve boredom in the moment, right? Uh, failure within these games is, is pretty low risk, unlike the real world, where if we have a failure in some area of our life, that can have some significant and maybe long-term consequences. But within a game, you can uh, you know, respawn, regenerate, reboot, what have you, and uh, start over and uh, you know, uh, practice till you get better and, and pass those, those hurdles without any uh, judgment necessarily from anybody else. The social connection, extremely, extremely important for many people who engage uh, in gaming. I'll talk about this a little bit later on uh, as well, but this is why um, you know, I, I think the harm reduction model, which we talked about a little, a little bit last week um, when B was speaking is, is um, going to be more important uh, for those of us who are therapeutically addressing people with a gaming disorder because it, it may be more about um, uh, you know, identifying why they're using for gaming and the specific genres of games that are problematic for that individual and identifying other ones that they can engage in and non-problematic uh, play in and still satisfy some of these needs. But these friendships that people have online, while many of us don't think of these as real world quote friendships, these are uh, both uh, you know, subjectively real worlds, the physical world and the online world. And these, a lot of these friendships are very real, even though the person may not ever physically meet that person, they become confidence, confidants um, and uh, uh, true friends in every other uh, sense of the words and those inter uh, actions. And so very important, um, especially those of us that are parents, when we think about, you know, completely removing those connections as some type of, of punishment, that we be aware that those, those impacts may be uh, detrimental in and of themselves. Um, obviously, escape, uh, you know, just like gambling or a, a substance can be escape from dealing with a real world responsibility, you know, uh, physical world responsibilities. Um, uh, or pain that we've experienced, um, uh, gaming can certainly satisfy that. Uh, achieve, achieving goals. A lot of people are very achievement oriented within these games and their mission really is to kind of complete, uh, complete that game and get the satisfaction that goes along with, with uh, completing either missions within game or the game itself. The sense of certainty, there are known rules that, that um, always stay the same within the, within the games or that you can learn about through time. Um, sense of personal control that you have in the gaming environment. And yes, and I know a lot of people just hate to hear this, and, and especially parents sometimes, but gaming is now a, a viable career. I'll talk about that a little later on. Um, but for some, uh, for some uh, youth and, and adults, uh, various segments that, uh, of this community, as well as all of the supporting infrastructure, uh, are there and are very real. Um, this is from just a few months before the pandemic hit, a New York Times article asking, can you really be addicted to video games? Uh, latest research suggests it's not far-fetched uh, at all. Um, and uh, absolutely true. But when is gaming really a problem? Uh, and, you know, we, we have a tendency to, to look at this photo here. There's a, a young man who is either fallen asleep playing or he's in distress over his is game and um, we think, well, yeah, that's that's problematic behavior. Well, maybe, maybe not. Just like with gambling, we can't take a snapshot of a moment in time and know whether that person is is suffering from an actual uh, disorder, even problematic behavior. Even recreational players have have bad days, right, and have those times when they may binge on something or use it as an escape, but they're not part of a, a chronic and progressive. Uh, behavior. So recognizing, again, the vast majority of people can do so for entertainment that may have bad moments that look like it's a problem. And those are good times to engage that individual um, with some questions about their behavior. So 
this is the way that the World Health Organization uh, recognizes a gaming disorder or defines a gaming disorder uh, in the ICD-11, which is the International Classification of Diseases. And it's pretty simple, uh, really just um, uh, three things, a pattern of gaming behavior, digital gaming or video gaming, characterized by number one, impaired control over the gaming. So that inability to set uh, limits of, of, of time uh, and or money, right, on gaming. Increasing priority given to gaming over other activities uh, to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests in daily and daily activities and continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. So pretty simple and you can fit a lot of those into those criteria, uh, but basically looking at the past 12 month behaviors, if, if the person meets these three, it's enough, enough to meet that definition. By contrast, um, this, these are the symptoms that the DSM-5 proposes that will be used to uh, recognize internet gaming disorder. Uh, don't get confused by any difference between gaming disorder and internet gaming disorder. Gaming disorder does incorporate internet use. Uh, I think um, DSM-5 just incorporated internet in the formal title, recognizing that the, the internet um, connection uh, and uh, the immersion and the, the game changes and updates that occur within that environment can, uh, can be, be the factors that lead to some of the problematic play for some people, but we're talking about the same thing essentially. But what, what do you notice here about these, these signs and symptoms? And here's, here's the other four. Basically, if we put those up side by side, uh, gambling disorder and gaming disorder as the DSM-5, uh, defines them, they are virtually identical. Isolation is one that is, is listed as a factor with gaming that isn't with gambling. Bailouts are one that is listed with gambling that's not listed with gaming. But I think we can all agree that we can see isolation and bailouts universally across you know, both of these two, regardless of whether they're um, listed as formal criteria. It's not unusual at all uh, to see, see those listed. Um, for those of you who are interested in research, this is an article that was published uh, online initially early this year, and I, I assume it's out in print now in addiction. And uh, this is a, a basically a Delphi study, which is a way of achieving consensus around an, an issue. And in this case, there were about 40 or so uh, international experts uh, on various aspects of this field that looked at um, the DSM-5 and ICD-11 diagnostic criteria and one, found out something really interesting. They basically uh, agreed as a group ultimately that there were some DSM-5 proposed criteria that were not clinically relevant for uh, internet gaming disorder, uh, including both tolerance and deception. And in fact, these may pathologize non-problematic patterns of gaming. Whereas the ICD-11, those three simple uh, categories are likely to diagnose gaming disorder adequately and avoid patho pathologizing. And so the last thing we want to do, those of us that are involved in, in assessing and, and treating individuals, of course, is over pathologize a behavior that really is not, uh, not pathologic in, in, neighbor, in, in nature and, and over stigmatize someone who is likely already uh, um, found, uh, found some stigma, some both self-stigma as well as stigma from uh, other, uh, other people on this issue. So I suspect, um, I, I don't have any insider knowledge, but I suspect when the next version of the DSM-5 comes out that they will affirm this as a real thing. But I wouldn't be surprised if the diagnostic criteria look a lot more like the World Health Organization diagnostic criteria when that happens. I noticed uh, it looks like we've got some, some chat questions. I haven't, are there any actual questions or are we still good? No, I think we're still good, Ted. Okay. Um, a comment about mirror, the criteria mirroring gambling disorder. Yes, okay, very good. So, so yes, while those were suggested, it looks like there's not, not this one-to-one -one relationship we think we might have seen between gambling and the gaming disorder. And there's some subtleties we need to be uh, 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 mindful of. 
And I think, again, there's this, this tendency for, especially those of us that are, that are parents and looking back on our own childhood to think, you know, the kids have gone crazy. Here's an article from the New York Times from February. A lamentable amount of gambling is being done just now among the students at Yale, and it's been going on for the past three weeks. On the authority of one of the students, it has stated that nearly one-fourth of the students in the u- university have caught the fever. So this is, this is a, a pretty alarming but this is an article from 1887, uh, New York Times, about gambling behavior among students at Yale. So this is not a new thing that has been inspired by recent access to uh, media. This is something that has been, um, that there has been concern at least uh, about. We need to be a little bit uh, mindful of, of not, um, not diving too, too deeply down the, the rabbit hole um, with uh, you know, the emergency of new technologies in terms of its effect. It's probably affecting the exact same populations as it would have been before these technologies were available. And I wanna thank Julie Hines for uh, sharing this slide with me. Let, she let me steal it and she in turn stole it from Debbie LaPlante, uh, uh, excellent uh, researchers and uh, awareness advocates in their own right. But I, I thought it was great when I, when I saw this that uh, I said, I've, I've got to borrow that for my presentations. And um, a lot of these uh, next several slides that I'll share are part of uh, an awareness program that I put together uh, here in the Clark County School District um, that is aimed at both parents and or students. So it's designed to be uh, presented to either of those audiences separately or together. Just the way I approach it is slightly different if they're in the rooms uh, together. And certainly the things that I talk about are the way I talk about it are a little bit different. So um, that's why some of these slides have a little bit different look. Uh, One of the things I like to talk with parents about is to remind them that a lot of these games that they buy for Xbox and PlayStation and even some of the downloadable ones, you can get to uh, the the ratings for them that are provided by the Entertainment Software Ratings Board. So pay attention to these. These are a good general guide from the the E for everyone, which is generally suitable for all ages, E10 plus, again, generally suitable for age 10 and up, you might have some crude, uh, uh, some crude minor language um, uh, beginning at that age that gets a, you know, a lot more at the, at the teen age where you see some, some, um, some violence start to appear that's not exactly graphic in, in nature, but you might see some blood, the, the swear words get a little, uh, little higher in level, but this is also the level at which you may see simulated gambling in these games. Um, and so be aware of the games that your children are, are playing. Um, we're, we're still really doing research on whether the, the simulated uh, gambling is going to have, a, have an effect later on, but there are some worrying trends in some areas that I'll talk about uh, shortly. But know what's in these games, um, and often these uh, labels will, will tell you exactly why they have their uh, rating mature, generally suited, suitable for ages 17 and up, may contain intense violence, blood, strong language, uh, uh, strong sexual situations, and also um, they've recently added just in the past year and a half or so uh, this uh, um, add-on about in-game purchases and uh, the fact that users interact. And so in these much younger categories, you may see um, uh, the fact that users can interact, uh, become aware of your parental controls and how you can keep that from happening if that's a concern. And you should certainly be having these conversations with your kids at a level that they're, you know, as early as they're able to understand about what that means to interact with people online and how people aren't necessarily who they say they are in the online uh, space, right? Uh, although, to my earlier point, um, the, the friendships that can develop are, are real. And then adults only 18 plus may contain gambling with real money in these cases. But there's been this increased kind of gamification of the, the, um, the gaming theater uh, if you will. And it occurs in a lot of different ways. Talk a little bit about freemium games. So I mentioned these a little earlier. These are games that are absolutely free to download and play, but which require money to unlock certain features or progress more rapidly in the game. Um, 
maybe, uh, you know, I mentioned the dollar figure early on, but 90% of all revenue from Apple App Store, for example, are from those that are absolutely free to download and play. So it's the additional purchases, the additional microtransactions that are occurring within the, these environments that are leading to the majority of revenue generation for Apple App Play, Google, Google Play Store. And uh, a lot of you will recognize these games, Farmville, Clash of Clans, Plants vs. Zombies, Candy Crush, Words with Friends. I myself have played Candy Crush and Words with Friends. Candy Crush I found fairly early in my recovery, and uh, I noticed fairly quickly um, that uh, that I was starting to make in-app purchases, and not only was I starting to make them, but they were starting to escalate over time. So I, I haven't played Candy Crush since that time because of that. And those of us that are in recovery from other addictive disorders need to be pretty mindful of the other things that are out there, both you know, whether they're substance-related or behavioral-related, uh, that uh, we're paying very close attention to our own uh, reaction. Uh, to engagement in those activities. Uh, my daughter, I know, has played Farmville, Plants vs. Zombies, Clash of Clans. Um, she's now 15, almost 16, but uh, fairly early on, really before I had educated myself too much about uh, video games at all, was playing some of these and had started to ask about making purchases. And for a while, her mom and I uh, allowed her to do some of those. And uh, since then, however, she she since I became more educated, um, that's not something I allow her to do anymore. Uh, some of these games that you can download, again, that are absolutely free to play, are marketed kids very young ages. So this is one that I borrowed from Cam Adair and uh, a game called Kid Doctor. You can, you can be either a doctor or a dentist and you can, you can treat other kids and help get them better. It sounds, sounds great. Oh, wow, educating about the importance of, of being a doctor and the role that person uh, might play. But there is some incredibly predatory stuff that occurs within this game. Uh, number one, occasionally a page will pop up that allows that child to make these in-app purchases. Again, these are being marketed to very, very young children. Uh, so again, those of you who are parents, if you have your credit cards linked to the download of these games, which most of us do, um, make sure that you've disabled those parts of the apps that allow you to make these purchases because there are some pretty awful stories of kids running up thousands of dollars uh, in these purchases, really not knowing what they were doing, not having a concept of, of what the, the real money is and this coming back to, to bite parents. And what's especially awful about this one is even if you teach your child to click on this little red X to exit out of this uh, part of the game and not buy something, if you decide not to buy anything, it pops up with this image of a crying child, right? I mean, how manipulative is, of this is this emotionally for that child to say, oh, I, I didn't buy something and now this, this picture of a child is crying, right? Just, just awful. Um, here are some popular video games uh, some of you may be familiar with that have gambling in, in them. As a matter of fact, gambling is a, an important part of how you progress in most of these games. And these are from partycasino.com. They list kind of their top five, um, top five games with gambling in them. Fortunately, all of these are rated M for mature, right? I'm glad to see there aren't any that are uh, being marketed um, for a younger audience in this particular case. Um, be really remiss not to talk about loot boxes when discussing this subject. I think a lot of you, or some of you at least, heard that term for the first time last week. Um, those of you who are, are therapists certainly should be familiar with it, especially if you're thinking of branching out into this area of treatment. Here's a few visual examples of what loot boxes can look like. Uh, pardon, pardon me for not mentioning the uh, uh, trigger warning. I meant to do that before. Uh, some of this imagery, um, but they present as some type of container within the games, and they are essentially usable virtual items which can be used or open to receive a random selection of further virtual items or our loot. And these can be really simple items that you could have gotten anyway had you just played a little longer in the game, or they could be super rare items that you're unlikely to get through regular gameplay. Uh, and what makes these um, particularly problematic and analogous to uh, uh, gambling behavior in their persuasive psychology and me mechanics often is the fact that this, this is an additional in-app purchase that you are making 
where you don't know what you're buying, right? So it's, it's like the slot machine, putting the money into the slot machine, hoping for that big rare payout, but generally getting either you know, nothing or nothing of value or something very little of value. And some of the, some of the uh, odds percentage on actually winning some of these things are, are less than one in 10,000. So if this is a 99 cent purchase, which seems like very little at the time, but you're spending thousands of 99 cent purchases in order to, to get that, that, that weapon or that armor or just the, the change in your appearance, that, that rare skin that gives you more credibility within the game, it can be very uh, problematic for some people. And in fact, loot boxes have been defined and regulated as a type of gaming or gambling, sorry, in many countries. And they may eventually be regulated as such in the United States in some way. Uh, uh, I know that um, uh, there was a U.S. senator that, gosh, as early as I think a good two years ago at least, introduced some legislation uh, looking at this and trying to regulate uh, and restrict minors' access to these type uh, of features. Um, again, just a few months before the pandemic hit, an uh, article from the UK um, talking about kids chasing losses on online games like uh, Fortnite, which has the ability to make in-game uh, purchases um, should be aware uh, you know a lot of games that are marketed to especially teens but in some cases younger uh, have loot box features within them and this is just a list of many many games that some of you may recognize if if any of you consider yourself gamers you'll probably recognize most of these titles but all of these have some type of loot box feature uh, within them and there have been uh, numerous studies now that show links between loot box spending and problem gambling. The, the progression of that is a little less understood, but certainly among people who, who exhibit problematic gambling behaviors and who also game, there is problematic loot box uh, use. So there has been a lot of concern over whether or not loot box features um, within video games uh, may be a gateway to to uh, actually developing a gambling uh, a problem. And I'll mention something about that uh, uh, shortly, actually. Um, just a few months ago, games with loot boxes were officially banned for minors in Germany. Other countries that have already re regulated it include Japan, China, Netherlands, Belgium, and the UK. Um, incredible prevalence, again, of loot boxes in both mobile and desktop games. A survey of the top 100 grossing games on both Google Play and Apple App Store and the most 50 played games on Steam, 58%, 59% Google, Google Play and iPhone of the, those games contained loot boxes. 93% uh, of Android games that featured loot boxes and 95% of iPhone games that featured loot boxes were deemed suitable for children age 12 plus. So this is very um, very early to have the, you know, the reward center in the brain, brain, in the brain targeted with, with mechanics that essentially mimic uh, gambling that we think of as more, more traditional gambling. Um, only about 39% of desktop games that were uh, featured, that featured loot boxes were available to children 12, eight, uh, 12 plus. So a little bit better in the PC realm in terms of, of how they're marketing them, but still widely available. Um, this is a study from just about a year ago that actually looked at that gate, gateway hypothesis. I think one of the few that, that has specifically, maybe the only one that I'm aware of so far that has specifically looked at that. And interestingly enough, their review suggested, and this was kind of a, a meta-analysis looking at, at several different studies, that at best there was only a small, small correlation that exists between overall gambling and video engagement. So this is looking at the whole universe of people that engage in gambling video gaming behaviors, not just problematic. And they find even less evidence to support a direct relationship with problem gaming and problem gambling. However, problem gambling symptoms appear to be positively related to loot box purchases. And this has been found in multiple studies uh, overall in time. But this particular study found little convincing evidence in support of the gateway hypothesis. But this is a very young research field again. And it seems like a new study comes out every week or two. So you know, stay tuned on that. Uh, Fortnite actually sell, settled a lawsuit earlier this year based on a loot box that they had within one of the versions of their Fortnite games that, you know, not only um, 
did it, you know, encouraged people to purchase these loot boxes. Uh, some of the features were only available through loot boxes and they found out some of the algorithms they were using actually disadvantaged people who didn't purchase loot boxes. So big class action lawsuit, people who had purchased these uh, and, and they've since didn't con discontinued this feature is my understanding that people who had purchased these got $50 um, back from Epic Games. And also, wasn't this nice? They were compensated with a thousand V-Bucks, virtual bucks that they could go back and spend within the games. You know, pretty, pretty smarmy part of the settlement in my, uh, my estimation, but there you go. Um, I would like to play um, a couple very brief uh, videos. Uh, this first one by Cam Adair that talks uh, from his own perspective. Um, and this video is about eight years old now, so slightly dated, but still very relevant in, in talking about how, uh, you know, whether this is a real thing and, and let's, you know, what better person to hear it from than someone who has experienced it. So this is a TED talk that he gave uh, about eight years ago. Let's see if we can get this working. How's the sound, okay? For over 10 years, I was addicted to playing video games. This addiction affected many areas of my life, including being a major influence in my decision to drop out of high school at the age of 15. Eventually, my parents got on my case to get a job, so I got one. I say got because I pretended to have a job for months. Every morning at 7 a.m., my dad would drop me off at the restaurant where I was a prep cook. After he drove off, I'd walk across the street and catch the bus back home sneaking in through my window and going to sleep. I had been up all night playing video games. The truth is, I didn't want to do these things. I just did. The addiction controlled the behavior. Three years ago, I decided to make a change. I had just moved back home to Calgary, Canada from living on Vancouver Island, and I couldn't get over this feeling of immense disappointment in myself. I moved to Vancouver Island inspired to take on new challenges, only to be left playing video games 16 hours a day for five months straight. I felt like a failure, and unfortunately, this was a feeling I knew too well. So I did what anybody would do. I Googled it, and the answers I found... <laughs> and the answers I found were incredibly frustrating. They were suggestions like study more, when the whole reason I was playing video games was to avoid studying, or to hang out with friends when all my friends played video games. Not knowing what else to do, I decided to quit cold turkey. And after a few months, I learned key lessons that led to major breakthroughs in my recovery. And knowing others were struggling with this addiction, I decided to share my story. I wrote a blog post online titled How to Quit Playing Video Games Forever. And the response? Overwhelming. But is video game addiction really that big of a problem? I mean, we're talking about video games here. Sure, I had my own personal experience with it, but did this problem scale? Or was I just one of the unlucky ones? Current research suggests that 97% of youth play video games, which equates to 64 million kids in the US alone between the ages of 2 and 17, with the fastest growing age group kids aged 2 to 5. In the UK, 10% more kids aged 2 to 5 know how to operate a smartphone application than know how to tie their own shoes. Unfortunately, the debate surrounding video games focuses on whether you should play or not, when that's like saying should you drink or not. If you can do it in moderation, that's fine. But what if you can't? What if right now you're stuck at home playing video games and you want to stop and don't know how? Imagine for a second how this makes you feel. Do you feel a sense of pain? What about feelings of guilt? Shame? Do you feel confident, anxious, depressed? Now, this wouldn't be a good TEDx talk unless I shared the lessons I learned and how you can use them to help yourself or someone you know overcome this addiction. It's not about the games, it's about why you play the games. If you can understand why you play games, you can move on from them. There are four main reasons why you play games. First, they are a temporary escape. After a tough breakup at the age of 18, playing games online gave me the perfect way of not having to deal with the situation. I could simply get absorbed in games and play for hours and hours. Second, Games are social. Staying home on a Friday night doesn't seem so bad when you're at home playing games with your friends online. Not only that, but games offer a clean slate on the social ladder. 
Being bullied when I was younger didn't exactly leave me feeling very confident in my social standing. I felt misunderstood, unaccepted, and unsure how to fix it, even though I wanted to. Playing games online gave me this opportunity. I could be who I wanted to be. Nobody knew my history, and I was judged based on my ability to play the game and not on my current social standing. Third, games are a challenge. They give you a sense of purpose, a mission, a goal to work towards. This is an achievement paradigm. Achievements multiply the opportunities to experience success. Finally, you see constant measurable growth. This is a feedback loop. You get to see progress. When you're at school, you struggle to improve your social standing. But online, you're able to see rewards for the efforts you put in. Consider how it feels when you're finally able to see progress in something. Consider how it feels when you're able to see that the goal you set out for is achievable. Combine these four areas and you have a very addicting process. So where do we go from here? How do we fix this problem? Video game addiction is a habit developed over time by becoming your go-to activity whenever you're bored. So parents, it starts with you. I'm sorry to say, but the iPad is not the new babysitter. They need interaction, not entertainment. Next, gamers play for very... <laughs> Next, gamers play for very specific reasons. Identify their motivations and help them find these in other activities. Help them with their social skills. The truth is they struggle to make friends. Lastly, don't punish them for their desire to play these games. Come from a place of compassion and encouragement, not judgment. We're so caught up in asking whether this is a real addiction or not that we've lost sight of what truly matters. How do we help these people stop playing video games? But there is another way. The truth is, this is about the idea of feeling trapped in something you want to move on from. It's about the freedom to live your life the way that you want and on your own terms. And sometimes all you need is permission. Permission to move on from something you want to move on from. Permission to stop playing video games. So if you're out there, whether you're in the audience or you're watching at home, I want you to understand one thing. You have permission. Thank you. Okay, I've got another one, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on from, from uh, that one. But Cam Adair is probably um, more responsible than any other single person for bringing public awareness uh, to this issue, uh, quite frankly. I first met Cam uh, about eight years ago, actually. Yeah, I think his first, first professional conference presentation was at the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling. And it was remarkable. Uh, and he basically on his own, uh, as he mentioned here, developed this website called Game Quitters, which is a fantastic resource. I'd encourage all of you to go out and visit, uh, go and visit it, whether you are someone concerned for yourself or somebody else in your life or the parent of someone, um, uh, you can find um, uh, multiple support forums on this website uh, to engage with others that are going through the same thing. I know, there are tens of thousands of members of this site now. I think Cam said his youngest member was seven years old and he's got somebody who's 93 or something like that, right? So the, the demographics are across the entire spectrum. Dozens of countries, uh, people are members from dozens of countries, but he really hit upon some really interesting um, kind of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, remedies without having any formal education about these, these things at all. He, there are uh, multiple kind of one to two minute soundbite videos on different aspects for those of us with short attention spans that you can listen to for free. And there are some products you can purchase to help you go into more depth within uh, your own person or within the family for this, uh, for this issue. But it's a, a fantastic resource that I want to let everybody uh, know about. Uh, this other video that I'm not going to show, um, again, is just one of his short messages to parents. Um, parents, stop, stop telling your children that they're addicted to something. He talks about how stigmatizing that is for a child to, to hear that, that, you know, oh, you're addicted to your, your games. You know, address the behavior that's a result of, of uh, what you perceive, uh, you know, as, as an addiction, regardless of whether it is clinic, clinically or not. It needs to be a, a collaborative process and, and, uh, and a, a process through which you develop a rapport of trust with your, with your child in, in addressing these lot of issues that's going to bring about the, the uh, behavioral change before it becomes a, a problem. Also, I mentioned this early, try to reframe your discussion around gaming so you refrain from using terms I think we've all gotten used to using, 
the virtual world and the real world, which can further stigmatize those who game. Both of these uh, worlds are subjectively real. Try to use the words digital world or online world and physical world instead, because those do not convey any type of, of judgment. And I also mentioned already about using uh, a gamer. Uh, Cam provides these questions on his website, and these are straight out of the proposed DSM-5 criteria about asking yourself uh, uh, about these areas of your life and, and giving the suggestion if you meet five or more of these during the past 12 months, consider, consider seeking out professional help. I've gone ahead and done the same thing with the ICD-11 uh, diagnostic criteria. Are you able to set and keep limits of time and money spent on it? Are you giving increasing priority? Are you continuing to play the games even though there are growing negative consequences in one or more areas of your life? And that's remember, uh, you know, let's not forget the family impact, whether we're talking about gambling or gaming. And this is actually a slide I use in both my, my gambling and gaming presentation. Whose family is it? Well, it's, it's everyone in the family's problem if it's one person's problem, right? Is she mad at him because he, he spent all weekend online uh, playing virtual poker with his friends when they were supposed to go, go out um, uh, on a day trip over the weekend? Uh, is he mad at her because she spent $250 playing Candy Crush, uh, you know, over the past week? Or are they upset at each other because they didn't know about the parental controls on this little girl's game that led to her spending $11,000 in purchases on mom's credit card before they they figured out and they let it go for too long and now the, they don't have a lot of recourse. So any of these things can be true. Um, I always uh, give some advice to those who are student gamers uh, and what they can do to maintain a healthy level. You know, occasionally going through these questions, asking themselves, talking about their parents about daily limits, uh, thinking of, of gaming as something they do to reward themselves for finishing those other obligations and chores uh, rather than a way to avoid them. And again, not using gaming generally as a means to escape from or uh, avoid responsibilities. If they want to, if they're really interested in stopping completely, you know, committing to quitting for 90 days as an experiment, uh, finding those new non-gaming activities on their own that help them achieve some of those, those uh, things that gaming was replacing for them, using a daily cam calendar to schedule out their days so that they're not getting bored suddenly because there's nothing to do, right? And there are some uh, additional support uh, communities, game quitters I mentioned, uh, Reddit has a stop gaming forum, and there's also a, co a computer gamers anonymous, uh, um, computer gamers anonymous association. I've got that spelled out later. <laughs> um, what can I do as a parent? Again, start talking about this early. Listen to your children. Educate themselves about potential risk. Know what behavior is normal. Certain amount of risky behavior, unfortunately, in the teen years is, is something that's going to happen, even with the best parenting, uh, setting rules and making that process collaborative and talk about why you're setting those. So, you know, all of these things are, are generally um, uh, uh, good advice. Uh, some things from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry with regards to uh, screen time, uh, you know, children eight to 12 spend four to six hours in front of screens on average teens spend up to nine hours so this is cumulatively when you consider schoolwork computer work time with friends time playing games it's a lot of time and too much screen time has been associated with quite a few different uh, types of, of problems among uh, young kids as well as uh, adolescents so being aware of that um, and these are screen guidelines, <laughs> ironically, that, that were posted on the website immediately prior to the pandemic. And people almost universally, in, including in, in, uh, in treatment communities, recognize that a lot of these have gone completely out the window with the pandemic in terms of uh, both people in their work environments as well as kids for uh, schoolwork are spending a lot more screen time uh, as part of their, uh, you know, non-entertainment part of their lives. So, you know, recognizing that first of all, but until 18 months of age, really their only interaction should be along with an adult talking to an additional person on that screen that they may know. Really, that's the only engagement. And between 18 and 24 months, limited to watching educational program and doing that alongside a, a caregiver, right? Uh, as Cam mentioned, we should not use these devices 
as a replacement for babysitting or interaction with her kids. I was absolutely guilty of that when my daughter was young. I really didn't know about it. I just knew she was absolutely engaged if I plopped her down in front of the TV watching Finding Nemo for five times you know, in a row or putting that iPad in her hand, right? And then as, that, as they get uh, older, uh, engage them more in, in helping them become good self-regulators in these areas, right? Because good self-regulating children become good self-regulating uh, adults. So making them aware of these all, uh, all of these issues. And then we should all turn off our screens and remove them from the bedrooms 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime. How many of us follow that advice? Here are some additional resources. I mentioned self-help. Computer Gaming Addicts Anonymous is what CGAA stands for. That is available online, just as many of the other 12-step uh, groups have gone online during the pandemic. Um, those of you who are therapists that are interested in getting additional level of training, uh, uh, Cam Adair in partnership with with, gosh, Jameson Wigg Wiggins, a couple of other psychologists have developed a fantastic uh, online training program that is self-directed. It's about 15 hours long and it is constantly being updated with the latest research. I was one of the first cohort to go through and test this program and I was amazed at how um, both relevant and current, literally publications that I knew had come out the week before were included in the references for this training. And um, this is also a part of the process of getting an actual international gambling counselor certification through, or excuse me, gaming certification through the International Gambling Counselor Certification Board, through the I IGCCB. So if you are interested, I would strongly encourage you in getting that additional education. It really does a deep dive into the different genres, the different type of gamers that are out there, the different reasons uh, people game, your, your ability to kind of uh, uh, put together the recovery process uh, and what that looks like. It is absolutely fantastic. I'm not a therapist, so I can't screen or treat anyone, but it, it's, it's great information for those of you that work in the prevention arena as well. Um, if you're if you're a, a research geek like me, you can go down a great rabbit hole through youthgambling.com. Uh, Jeff Derevinsky uh, with McGill University in Canada. Uh, that's part of his organization, and there you can you can find tons of different research links in both youth gambling and gaming from that one. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for actual therapy for someone uh, and someone who has been trained and certified to treat this. KindBridge is a relatively new organization, but it is insurance-based and telehealth only, and they are specializing in gambling and gaming disorder, though they certainly have co-occurring uh, treatment going on uh, as well. And there are, um, I'm not endorsing them specifically, it's just the group that I'm most familiar with, and I'm familiar with a lot of the people that are directly involved that I consider fantastic uh, uh, therapists. So uh, that's, that's a place to go. So in, in the little time I have left, and I'll try to get through this quickly so we have some additional uh, time for questions at the end, let's talk sports uh, a little bit. Sports gambling has soared also during the pandemic and in, uh, continues to uh, climb. The amount of gambling placed on, on sports, $4.3 billion just on the Super Bowl, which is the largest legal handle in history. More than 47 million uh, Americans had placed get, uh, bets as of this article, which is only halfway through the March Madness process, quite frankly, um, online bets. So the legalization of sports betting has been the principal driver of the increase in sports betting. And also, of course, during the pandemic, online sports books have become more popular. This is, where's my header? Okay, so a few things happened in 2018 that piqued my interest in this. Uh, the first was the Supreme Court struck down the Professional and Athletic Sports Protection Act, uh, which basically said it, it, it wasn't right that Nevada could be the only state to allow sports betting. We need to allow states to decide on their own whether to do that. And in a three short year period, um, 32 states have legalized gambling or uh, sports gambling. Uh, 22 of those are already live and legal and another 10 are legal but not yet uh, operational. The pandemic, let's, let's admit it, you know, as state coffers have uh, uh, emptied as a result of tax dollars not flowing in, uh, a lot of states have likely accelerated this process to, to get income flowing uh, from, from tax revenue as a result of the pandemic. Um, 
The other thing that happened is the Vegas Golden Knights, which is our amazing hockey program here in, in Las Vegas. I got a phone call out of the blue. Um, uh, you know, one of the thing I do, things I do is consult to the Nevada Council on Problem Gambling in the area of community engagement. And a friend of mine had been appointed uh, director of their foundation. And he said, Ted, we've got $23,000 we'd like to donate to the Nevada Council. Can you guys spend it? <laughs> of course, everyone knows the answer to that question. Of course, we can spend it. And um, so this generous con contribution, and it turns out their, their mission statements uh, scale and overlap very well with you know, physical, social, emotional growth of Las Vegas youth, emphasis on sports, making sustainable, scalable, positive impact on health and wellness through research, education, and prevention, enhancing teaching, K-12. So all of their missions over, overlap really well of enhancing problem gambling, uh, gaming awareness in Las Vegas community. The other thing that happened, and these all happened literally within a three-month period, is I attended a presentation at the National Conference on Problem Gambling in Cleveland, and I saw the presentation by Dr. Jeff Derevinsky on the, the longitudinal study of NCAA athletes uh, across all three NCAA divisions, and there were three tech takeaways that really struck me during that. Uh, number one, uh, you know, nearly 90 percent, about 74 percent of a uh, of female 88% male athletes, 74% of male student athletes have their first gambling experience prior to college. This is something that shouldn't shock too many people. But also among those athletes, 24% of men and 5% of women reported having wagered on sports in the previous year. And every single one of them is potentially jeopardizing their eligibility to play at the NCAA level by engaging in that activity regardless of whether it's their own sport or regardless of whether it's at the NCAA level or professional level or amateur level, they are not allowed to wager on any sports that the NCAA has in a championship event in. Uh, and also as part of this study, they reported what the most significant factors influencing them not to bet on sports were. And the top three were the same for both men and women, although there was a, a little bit of a reversal in what those were. And they were the coach, NCAA penalties and their teammates. And so based on these findings and recognition of my own involvement as a, you know, I, I was not an elite athlete. I had stopped playing mostly by the time I got to high school, but I was a little league all-star from the age of 10 to 12 and certainly was involved in betting on sports by the time I was in high school. And I developed a student athlete gambling awareness program that basically reverse, in, reverse engineered based on on data from Derevinsky's finding uh, on the NCAA uh, study. So looking at these factors and assuming that the slightly younger population is also influenced by a lot of these same things and is already engaged in a gambling activity in high school. Uh, the first time I presented this um, program was to the Liberty High School uh, football team, primarily the freshman uh, incoming football team, but some members of the varsity team as well, and some members of the wrestling and golf team were, were present. And uh, one of the questions I always give to my, uh, my youth programs uh, in the schools is how many of you have ever gambled on anything? And they ask for a show of hands, and then we redefine what gambling can be, including within video games. And by that time, 90% of the kids will raise their hand. When I asked this question to this particular group of primarily young men, almost universally, all the hands in the room shot up without hesitation. It was almost like, of course I gamble. Of course I gamble on sports. Of course I do fantasy sports. Very different reaction than the general student population. So this, this is a population that's particularly at risk for both gambling participation and gambling problems. But what they learn in this program is what gambling is, what problem gambling is, and how it differs from recreational gambling why engaging in gambling may be problematic for young people, why gambling on sports is particularly problematic for student athletes and trying to reach this population before they ever get to college, because this is where problem gambling prevalence tends to really uh, balloon before it shrinks down again to the levels of the general population, but particularly for athletes who may be jeopardizing their ability to play and even get an education if it's tied to scholarships. And so this, this whole program goes through uh, educating them about those NCAA policies and penalties, and also um, builds up the reputation of their coaches and teammates as a resource to re reach out to 
on things that are going on in their lives that they may not feel comfortable talking with other adults, including their own uh, parents. But giving a, a general look at any of the behaviors that are going on in their life right now that may jeopardize their dream. And every one of these student athletes at that age wants to go on and play at that next level college and eventually pro, even though we know how banishingly small that dream is. It's a real dream. And uh, you know, using that as leverage uh, on as a way to self-examine their own behavior is, is very important. They're exposed to real world cases of athletes being suspended or banned from playing, uh, as well as uh, that happening in the professional uh, world as well. And I want to finish out with just a few comments about esports. Um, these are, uh, you know, competitive video gaming that occur now in environments in major arenas that sell out in a matter of uh, minutes. They are highly attended, uh, highly competitive involve teenagers on up, involve gambling, online gambling, uh, as well as occasionally gambling that can be done in brick and mortar casinos. I want to mention our Hyper e X Esports Arena, which has been partnered for several years now with our Luxor Hotel and Casino. If you are at least 13 years old, you can walk in unaccompanied and put up your $15 an, an hour that's prorated if you want to spend up to 24 hours and engage in these games as long as the ratings level is appropriate. And if you're accompanied by a chaperone, need not be a parent or guardian, but a chaperone who is um, 17 years old or older, then you can engage in higher rated games and you can engage in the tournaments that are actually paying out money. So this is a, a there's a, a big problem in my mind with that. And I wanna show just a, a 30 second video that illuminates the intersection of these how do I get, I need to shrink it down briefly. Once, gaming was a simple pursuit. And then, it evolved. So this is the deep sports deep arena deep. at the Lexor Casino in you Las see, Vegas. You see, it never ends. Now, we're here. On the Vegas Strip. Anyone can play. Are you ready? I don't know. Are we ready? I think we're not entirely ready, um, is, my, is my guess. But it's here. It's here to stay. It is, uh, as I mentioned, um, a real career opportunity uh, for some, uh, quite frankly. And why am I missing? Apologies. Um, this is a map of participating high schools across the United States and Pacific Theater who have an esports team already. Here's Kansas uh, for you. These uh, indicate all of the high schools in Kansas that have an esports team, competitive esports team that is engaging in these tournaments already. This, of course, is, is Kansas City, a little over the, the border, but still, even without that blob, you've got dozens of high schools that are already involved. Uh, Harrisburg University in Pennsylvania became the first university to offer full ride scholarships to all 22 roster spots of its esports teams. But some Big 12 schools, a lot of the other Big Five conferences are uh, getting involved with esports, and many of them provide at least some esports scholarships. So these are a means for some kids to get to college and to pay for their college. Now, the chances of becoming pro in these areas are probably about as good as, as going pro in any major sports, but I, I did want to throw that out there. And this is a great resource for those of you in Kansas that are interested in reaching out regards, with regards to prevention and awareness. What a fantastic end to approach the schools and say, hey, we'd just like to talk to your team uh, about what gaming disorder is, internet gaming, game disorder, give some healthy practices, talk about its overlap with gambling. Great way to get into the schools to start having the conversation about problem gaming, problem gambling. Approach those schools that already have this program. And I know I've gone longer than I anticipated, but uh, happy to take uh, any questions that may have uh, arisen. That is my contact information. Any of you are welcome to contact me uh, directly if you've got follow-up that you think of at some point. And I will stop sharing my screen. Feel free to unmute yourself, or if there are questions in the in the chat, um, that's that's fine. I think we've got a, a small enough group that, that we can approach that either way.
Nothing. I covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to comment, um, Ted, on that on the map of Kansas that you showed with all the high schools. We're, of course, in the Wichita area. So I didn't realize there were that many <laughs> just in our area. That's pretty, pretty eye opening that someone from another state, you know, knows more about our own state than we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew nothing about that in our own state until early, <laughs> earlier this year, and I was researching it, and I found we've got 20 high schools in Nevada that already have esports teams, uh, you know, most yeah. of them in Las Vegas, but a smattering up around Reno, and even one in, in rural Nevada, way out in the middle of nowhere, so it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's an up-and-coming thing, and, but it is a great way, I think, to, to get involved with some awareness and prevention programs in some of the schools, because a lot of this concern is already out there in the public ether a little bit. And so I think administrators might be more likely and approachable around the video games than they are just specifically about gambling because the tendency seems to be think, oh, our kids aren't gambling at this age. They don't have the money to gamble, right? right. But, uh, right. Of, of course they are and they do and they find ways to, yeah. to get it. So, so what's, what's your advice for approaching those schools and those administrators about trying to get in there and, and share information? So, um, of course, personal contacts work, work best. They're a great way to start if you yourself either have, have kids or you have a connection to teachers at a specific school. It's a great, or administrators, that's a great way to have that initial conversation. And once you, you know, once you have your foot in the door and you've been able to show that you're you know, your program is not anti-gambling or anti-gaming, right? It's more about building awareness of how it can become an issue. I, I think then you can, can use that, that new contact, whether it's the coach of the esports team or the, the coach of that other sports team. And that's how I've approached it. There was a, a, um, a wrestling coach who had experienced uh, gambling problems himself, who found out about our youth awareness programs that had me come talk for a few years and he was the one I approached when I developed Saga about the sports one. And he was the one that brought the football coach in and all of these other teams for this kind of pilot, um, uh, pilot presentation. And then since then, you know, he's offered to connect me to other athletic directors at other high schools. And so that's kind of how we're building it, but we're really right at the beginning. So I wish I had better advice, but that's kind of my initial, initial advice. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Absolutely. Any, any other questions? I know it was a tremendous amount of, of information that I kind of fed you, fed you with a fire hose and you know, we could spend hours talking about any single aspect. I, I know we have a very diverse audience and I wanted to include information that would be useful, you know, whether you're a therapist, whether you are a, a, a concerned parent, whether you're in recovery yourself or you know, interested in research. And so I think I covered a little bit of all of those those areas, but we could certainly go into uh, more depth on anything. Ted, do you have a sense of how long we would have to wait to interview some of the students who are on the esports teams to see how they've avoided uh, you becoming trapped in the, you know, in that addiction? That's that, that's a great question. I mean, there are different ways to approach it. You know, as, as long as it's not like a research study, which requires um, not only a lot of money, but a lot of considerations and working with, with minor populations, right, in terms of getting permissions and, and things like that. And you would still have to do that if you're going to be interviewing a minor, certainly. But you could absolutely reach out to the, the college populations that already exist, many of whom I suspect are even at that level, not getting this education about, um, about gaming disorder and what that is. I mean, I hope they all are, um, you know, part of being on an esports team is not, you know, not our vision of the, you know, the couch, couch potato, somebody, you know, the, the, to use the analogy that President Trump used at one point, you know, the 400 pound guy in his basement, right? Uh, and that's, that's not um, what the esports teams are. If you look at the photos, these are usually some pretty physically fit groups. I mean, if you want to compete in this environment, you have to be not only emotionally healthy, you need to be physically fit for your brain to be functioning in these intense environments, right? The same is true of whether you're a football player or whether you're an esports player. 
re recognizing the repetitive motion issues, which I'm sure is addressed already. But um, you know, there, there's plenty of gamers out there and ex gamers you could you can interview about this process. I suspect already because esports e is not a it's a it's a new thing for a lot of people in the social consciousness, but it's it's really been happening in some form or another for decades. It's really just in the last decade that is, it has become very big and, uh, and uh, very publicly visible. So there are already those players, if you're interested in, in interviewing, I think that you could reach out. I don't have a specific name for you, um, but there are some that have retired, right? In their early twenties or become burned out or, you know, there, we have suicides with uh, problem gaming, just like we do with gambling. One thing I did not mention about Cam's talk, because that was sort of his very low level talk, is that he absolutely got to the point of suicidality and he had written out his note to his parents before he had that, you know, aha moment that he wanted to make that change. Because at that time in his life, there was nobody to reach out to, right? This wasn't being talked about a lot, even though they'd, you know, DSM had already started looking at it. He didn't know where to go. And, um, so that you know, we we shouldn't um, we shouldn't uh, uh, you know we should we should recognize that it, it can be that that serious just as it can can with gambling. Thank you. But this is a, this is a real big up and coming thing. Again, if you're a therapist interested in getting the certification, I'd encourage you to you know it'll cost you four or five hundred bucks to shell that out but you get some one-on-one -on -one time as well as some case studies to work on you really get a great background on this and i think all of us who are involved in that area you know recognize the additional level of training you know beyond alcohol and drugs that is needed to work very successfully with gamblers right and the same thing is true with gaming it's not a one-to-one -one relationship in terms of the conversation and some of the the um, the individualized treatment I think that that occurs so really you really want to get that additional level or at least know where to refer, refer people to right um, if if you don't have that that expertise and then if you're in recovery from from any one of these things again and, and choose to continue to engage in 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 something else be be hyper aware you know I, but I've had some during the pandemic and you know a time when I I got pretty bingy with one of my Xbox games. It wasn't interactive with any people, but it was, a, I'm sort of a completionist. I like to complete, complete that game and my, my fingers don't work as well as, as they did when I was 15 or 20 years old. I've, I've found for some of these games and being able to, to do it. So, you know, I started to see myself, you know, verge into some problematic behavior that I recognize because I'm in recovery from, from gambling disorder that other people might not have noticed in themselves. I see Chad's got his his hand up. So I do. oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thanks. No, that's good, Ted. Um, I had a request that I question if you'd be willing to share your presentation slides. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'll make a PDF of those and I'll send them to Glenna, and okay. then and then folks can get in touch with with her. And yeah, I'm happy to do this. And and like I say, if you're specifically interest, interested in the sports program, I've, you know, I've had Zoom meetings one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people just to kind of go through a lot of those slides and how I put that program together and, and talk about it in the school. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy, happy to do that. Um, um, you know, this is, for me, this is all about getting the information out to more people, especially those that are uh, interested in engaging yet more people, right? Whether they're parents or students or just members of the public on any of these issues and helping to destigmatize both gambling and gaming disorder to get help to more people. So I'm I'm perfectly happy to share share the slides. Awesome, thank you, Ted. All right. All right, does anybody else have anything else before we wrap up here? Any comments or questions or anything? I just want to thank you, Ted, for all of the information. That's great. Um, I think <laughs> we could probably have presentations weekly and it would change. It's, it, things are happening that fast. But um, certainly appreciate the information you shared today. Absolutely. And there's tons of great you know, presentations online, probably through YouTube. And, and really do check out Cam's site. Um, he's got just a wonder, wonderful collection of 
of short videos, again, for those of us with, with short attention spans, little snippets of, of gold, really. And I'm so glad that he shared, you know, not only his story, but just this re amazing resource that he he created out of whole cloth, really, on, on his own that I, I couldn't believe when he first presented on this, that he could have done this without input of some psychologists or without studying any of this at, at some college classes, because he intuitively hit on a lot of these things that have been part of our formal education in other areas that he, it was just, just kind of amazing. He's an amazing young man. Yeah. But thank you again for the invita invitation. I enjoyed uh, 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 presenting. And like I say, any of you are, are welcome to contact me um, uh, via email and reach out if you think of some, something I didn't cover or want to be connected to somebody else. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Yeah, thank you. We, we really in, enjoyed this and learned a, learned a lot of new stuff. So have a, have a great day. All right. Thanks. We'll go ahead and wrap up. And I'll just remind those of you that um, signed up for CEUs that will be getting the certificates out within the next week or so. Um, so don't worry if you don't get it right away. <laughs> Our community mobilizers taking care of those. So we'll make sure everybody gets those. If you don't happen to see something in the next couple of weeks, then, you know, contact us and let us know. But uh, we should be able to get that stuff out there. So I hope everybody has a safe and healthy weekend and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye everyone. Bye. Thanks.